From Connecticut Public Radio in Hartford, this is Seasoned. I'm Robin Doyon Aiken. Coming up this hour, you'll get to know Brooklyn-based writer, recipe developer, and food stylist Yuande Komalafe. In her work for The New York Times and elsewhere, she's a champion for West African cuisine. Her 2019 series for The Times, 10 Essential Nigerian Recipes, started a public conversation about the food of her heritage that continues in her first cookbook, My Everyday Lagos, Nigerian Cooking at Home and in the Diaspora. Producer Tegan Engel talks with Yuande about how her book captures the city of Lagos. She also explains how she connected more deeply with Nigerian food and cooking only after being away from it for almost 20 years. And later in the show, Tegan brings us a story from Reservoir Community Farm in Bridgeport, where Green Village Initiative is feeding its community and empowering the next generation of urban gardeners and farmers. But first, Tegan Engel and Yuande Komalafe. I first ate Nigerian food as a teenager. As a young chef in the 90s, I sought out the foods of many West African countries in the markets and restaurants of New York City and Boston. In 2000, I traveled to Lagos and other parts of Nigeria. There, I spent a lot of time in the kitchen and markets, only scratching the surface of this rich culinary world. But for decades, you didn't see a lot, if any, West African foods or culinary traditions in American food media. That started to shift a few years ago, when chef and food writer Yawande Komalafe started publishing her recipes in the New York Times. I was thrilled to see Nigerian food finally getting the attention it deserved. In My Everyday Lagos, Yawande gives us an incredible guide to Nigerian ingredients and cooking, while also reflecting on her own journey in life and food. I started by asking Yawande to share some of that journey and how it led to her book. I always knew that I would work in food. I was telling a friend the other day, I was like, I feel like if I wasn't working in food, I might as well just be dead. Like that's how strongly (laughs) I felt. And I've always felt that way, Mm. you know? I moved here to the US to go to college and coming from Nigeria, education, especially in my family, both of my parents went to school. They met in college in Berlin. It was just always known that we were going to go away for university or college. We picked the U.S. because we had family members here. But I moved here thinking that I was going to study food science and be a food engineer because that's what my mom did. And I think that was my first exposure to food as a practice. But I remember coming across the pamphlet for culinary arts school and it dawned on me that I could go to school for culinary arts and become a chef. So the journey to writing this book, I didn't know that I wanted to write a cookbook. I haven't always considered recipes, especially recipes from Nigeria or about West African food. I haven't encountered them in books Right. Recipes are passed down. It's an oral history. Even in writing this book, I had conversations with my mom. I drew from memory. I watched friends cook. I watched YouTube videos. And so I almost had to be pushed to do it. After my recipe started appearing in the Times, I got a lot of interest from publishers. And that was really the first time I was like, oh, I guess I could write a Nigerian cookbook. <laughs> And that process just took forever. It took about, took almost four years to write this cookbook because I wanted it to be a cookbook that spoke to the energy and the feeling more than precision. Because I feel like Nigerian cooking, West African cooking, Yoruba cooking is a feeling. Yes. (laughs) And I had to feel it to write it. It is so nourishing to hear you say all of these things, because when I was reading your book, I felt like it had the energy of Lagos. You have the colors, the fonts that you Mm. used, but also just the vibe, like you have the photos, which give real life things. But there's just Mm -hmm. I really feel like you captured the energy of the cooking and of Lagos in the book. And it's just amazing to hear you say that, because I was like, you did it. Wow. You put, you put you that vibe so in much print. For saying that. <laughs> That's really incredible to hear. Thank you. I like the book looks completely different from the proposal, and I'm grateful for that. Mm. <laughs> are there some really special things that are in the final book that you hadn't anticipated in your proposal? 
there's so much Yoruba spirituality in it. Mm, yes. <laughs> there's a whole chapter called The Weekend and Offerings. And I was trying to speak to the ways in which food has multiple meanings in culture, where it's not just a source of nourishment, but it's also a symbol. It also carries power. It opens up conversation. There are just so many symbolic meanings of food outside of enjoying it and getting nourished. And I really wanted to add that element to it. In the pages where I talk about the different symbolic meanings of food for baby naming ceremonies, that's yeah. such a beautiful chapter to me because it was something that I did outside of living in Lagos after I had kids. Can you and describe a that a little bit? I also did those ceremonies for my children. And yeah. Can you talk okay. about some of the elements you have, like the obi, kola nut, and tell yes, us some of the other yes, things and what yes. the symbolism is? So one of the first times I went back to Lagos after about 20 years, I was undocumented for about 10 years and couldn't go. But I finally was able to go back. And one of the most important highlights of the first trip back was my parents taking my husband, Mark, and I to Ilefe, mm -hmm. is known as mm -hmm. the seat of Yoruba culture. We literally came out the ground there, is mm -hmm. how the story goes. And so it's such a spiritual place. It's such a place that holds power. And it's such a historical place in Yoruba culture. And, you know, we're walking touring the King's Palace and we came to a place where one of the past kings was buried. And the tour guide said, we never say the king dies. We always say the king moves on because the king does not die he just transitions into another form or he like leaves this body in transitions. And it hit me then that at least since my brother passed when I was 17, I've always thought of death in that sense. I remember just surrounding my apartment along the years with various elements from Day of the Dead, because it was the first time that I had seen death depicted in such a way in a continuous way. Mm -hmm. And I realized that all of the things or a lot of the things that I felt about myself that didn't necessarily fit into the structures that exist were me being Yoruba. Mm. And <laughs> in that moment, I just had so much compassion for myself. I had so much love and understanding. And I feel like that moment really changed the way I moved through the world or the way I started moving through the world, because I, I just realized that I'm from somewhere. It's so interesting to say that because I grew up in Nigeria. I didn't really have the experience of not growing up around the culture. I like I inhabited the culture. It was part of me. I grew up in it. But there was a disconnect after moving here and after experiencing the 20 years apart from Lagos. Yeah. But going back to my book, knowing this, it just emboldened me to not fit in the structures that existed. Yeah, I see yeah. that you took so much bravery in how you did this book to really show up as your full self and say, like, I'm going to yeah. just do this. And yeah. thank you for sharing that that homecoming connection with Ileife. Mm -hmm. I can just see how that has like set you on this trajectory. And I'm so grateful for it. The book is centered around Lagos. I'm wondering if you could paint a picture for us of Lagos, like the sounds, the smells, mm. the vibes, so people can get a sense of why you rooted this book there. Lagos is such a special place. It's a port city, so it's right on the water. It's always been like an entry port and a seat of trade. And so Lagos is special in Nigeria because there are different port cities like that. There's also Port Takot that's similar, but it's special in that sense because you get elements from all across Nigeria in Lagos. And the reason I decided to center the book in Lagos is not only because I grew up there and it's a part of Nigeria that I know the most and my family my on my maternal side is from Lagos. It's just got this energy that's hard to describe and hard to understand, except you experience it. Like I wake up in the morning and I'm immediately surrounded by sound and buses going by and people yelling and, you know, the colors is, is another thing. The food, like I felt like my senses were just 
lit on fire the entire time I was there when I went back for mm. the first time yeah. um, after yeah, a while. Yeah. You know, beforehand, I, w- I had been running these dinners, my immigrant food is, and I was telling the story of something that I remembered. And then I went and encountered it again. And I was like, oh, I need to up the ante here. Like I need to, <laughs> like, you know, like yeah. everything needs to be at a hundred, right. like the flavors, the colors. So I came back with so much fabric and I would cover my apartment in fabric, just different colors. So just trying to bring in the element of the people and the energy that they bring to Lagos. The markets are bustling. <laughs> the traffic, the traffic is oh my goodness, so intense. The go slow I, markets. You know, <laughs> yeah, the go slow, go slow in oh the traffic God. where people are walking. There's yep. the traffic just stopped and people are walking just, between yes. selling things. Yeah. You know, and, and people are almost unafraid of cars there. <laughs> I tell this story where when I first moved here as a seven as a 16 year old, I thought that the horns in American cars didn't work because ah, nobody. Yes. Used them. Yeah, <laughs> there's a whole <laughs> communication system with horns and cars in Nigeria. Yeah, it's a oh, whole other and- thing. Yeah. And I was like, you go outside and that's the sound you hear of like car horns or like motorcycle horns or bicycle horns or people yelling. And so it's just got a vibrancy that's hard to bottle up. I think New York comes really close, but it's different in the way that if you are encountering Lagos for the first time, it's hard to know where there's no direction. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's you just pick a lane and run. <laughs> that is a great description. Yeah. And it's night and day. You have your night markets, your day markets. And... Exactly. Yeah. There's like yeah. an energy for the night and an energy for the day. Totally. Yeah. So I'm curious about this time. You know, you've had these 20 years here where you couldn't return to Nigeria. And mm. luckily, your parents came to visit you. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I'm wondering mm-hmm. about what were the foods that you missed most during that time? What did you request for them to bring to you and cook for you when they came to visit? I always wanted my mom to make eforiro. <gasps> yes. um, and that's the vegetable soup or stew, as we call it, the vegetable stew that's got a bunch of greens. It's got smoky flavors and chilies. And the base is our obeata, which is like our base sauce made from tomatoes, peppers, onions, and some chilies. But yeah, I would always request my mom to make it because she would make it so dry. I love it dry because I love to put stew, our red sauce on top of it. The ones that I had here were never dry enough. Like she would squeeze every single drop of water out of the spinach or whatever green vegetable she was using. But yeah, I would always request her to make eforiro. Another thing that I would request was moi moi mm-hmm. because that was something I missed. It's like a steamed bean cake is, yes. is what yeah. I would call it. It's a savory dish. It's ground honey beans that are pureed with a little bit of onions, peppers, and tomatoes. And they're steamed in banana leaves. Like the proper way to make it is to steam them in leaves. Yes. Here we steam them in aluminum foil. But yeah, so delicious. That because that was so time consuming and it took forever. And <laughs> if you don't get the texture right, it could either go from being dense to not firming up at all. And my right. mom just knew how to get the texture right. Mm, yeah, that dish definitely takes some technique to get right. And mm-hmm, I love that mm-hmm. you mentioned the FO Riro because you have that in your book and you make it with Tete with Kalaloo leaves, am- yes, amaranth leaves. Yeah. All those words are the same leaf in different languages. It actually grows like wild. I have it all in my yard. It grows so well in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I checked with my farmer friend and they were like, yeah, you can eat it. And I've been having the summer of my life because I've been making Eferuro with like fresh teta from my garden. (laughs) That's so great. Yeah, we have so much of it growing and I was so excited to see that recipe. So I'm, yeah. and you have mackerel in it, so like a smoked mackerel that gives it a that smoked smoky, mackerel. Yes. Smoky it's taste. the closest I could get to the, um, <laughs> the smoked fish. The smoked fish. Yeah. yeah. The smoked fish. <laughs> yes. Yeah. When I came back from Nigeria, a friend said, please bring us some smoked fish. And so we tried, yes. we tried to bring it back for them. So, um, <laughs> You talked about this base recipe that you use for the stew. There's another one, Atadindin, that 
Um, mm-hmm. I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, but you um, are. Yeah, that's perfect. You have a lot of these kind of base recipes and starter sauces in the book. Can you tell us a little bit more about what those are and like what the importance of them is to these recipes? It's interesting because I came to Nigerian food as an adult after I had worked in restaurants here in the U.S. And I had worked in classic French pastry shops. I, I love my viennoiserie. I, you know, I could go on and on about how to layer butter into the <laughs> dough. Queen Amman. Um, uh, yeah, the Queen Amman. <laughs> exactly. Like, I still have a love for, like, classic French viennoiserie art. So I, I came to study Nigerian food, like outside of just experiencing it as a Nigerian, I came to it from the angle of someone who had studied other cuisine and who had gone to school and learned the classic French way of doing things and worked in Korean restaurants and, you know, and, mm-hmm. and worked in all these different restaurants and worked as a recipe developer And so I really had to take off that, I want to say colonialist mentality that our food didn't measure up Mm -hmm. because Nigerian food, I always thought that it was just something that I had. It's just something that existed. I never needed to examine it. And when I was able to put that colonialist way of thinking aside and inspect our food, just starting from scratch, inspect our food just as someone who knew nothing about it. I realized how complex and how intricate and how much work goes into building flavors in our food. And I came to really appreciate it. And so writing this book as someone who develops recipes I needed to break it apart first to bring it back together. And that's kind of what I'm doing with all the base sauces and the starter sauces is that I'm breaking the cuisine apart. I feel like we're so used to just saying, oh, that's our stew. But like, what is stew? Yeah. (laughs) It's like, what is stew to someone who's never experienced it before? And I also wanted to do that without overstepping our language or the way we think about food as West Africans. And so it's easy to say stew is a relish, but is it? Can it just be atadindin instead of describing it as a relish? Mm. I really felt that in the book. First mm. of all, you you have in each recipe these base recipes. So you'll say, you know, add your Trinity pepper sauce or your atadindin, mm-hmm. which are like peppers, tomatoes, onion, cooked in a certain mm-hmm. way or pureed in a certain way. And then you use that to make the stews. But you know, I think about when other foods of other cultures have been introduced, people might not know what wasabi was or mm-hmm. what, uh, you know, pine nuts were or other things. And so it's like people just used the words for that and they became part of our lexicon. And I like how you yes. did that in your book. You said, I'm going to use our language. I'm going to show you what I, it is in the beginning yes. so you can go back and look yes. what is that. But then I'm going to use yes. it in our recipe so that you start to see this is our language. Like this is how we yeah. do this. and. That came through so strong. Oh, I am so glad you say that because, you know, I I realized that I'm a classically trained chef, but I've been classically trained in the French method, but I'm also a classically trained Nigerian chef. Like there is Mm -hmm. that that exists. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't need to convert or change or whitewash or break down It's up to the reader to do some back work and treat our food as something to be respected. I like to think that the reader is a full person and coming to it with their full humanity, but I also expect them to see me as a full human being. And yes, that's, that's yes. that was my answer. <laughs> <laughs> so good, so good. You're listening to seasoned producer Tegan Engel talking with New York Times food columnist Yuande Komalafe about her cookbook, My Everyday Lagos. I'm Robin Doyon Aiken. It's time for a short break. When we get back, Tegan and Yuande will get into more of the fundamental ingredients of Nigerian cuisine, like red palm oil, agusi seeds, and fermented foods. Like, I love that back and forth with ingredients. I feel like I'm having a conversation with the ingredients and they're talking to me or they're telling me what they like and what they don't like. 
This is Seasoned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Seasoned, everyone. I'm Robin Doyon Aiken. You've been listening to producer Tegan Engel talking with recipe developer and New York Times columnist Yuande Komalafe about her first cookbook, My Everyday Lagos. Yuande has described some of her special ceremonial dishes and also the dishes she missed most during her years away from Lagos. Tegan picks up the conversation with Yuande by asking about some of the key ingredients of Nigerian cooking. Palm oil is such an important part of Nigerian cooking. Mm. I'm wondering if you could talk about the importance of palm oil, epo, in Nigerian yeah. cooking. There's nothing like the richness of palm oil. There's nothing like what it brings to the dish. It's floral. It's rich. It will just coat everything it comes across, like your spoon, your bowl, your pot, your clothes, um, your mouth, your tongue, your palate. Palm oil is such a fundamental ingredient. It's one of those things where the land knows and it Mm. provides for us. Mm. That is my Nigerian-ness. Like I firmly believe that Mm. the land just knows us in the same way we know it. And it provides for us the things that we need. And palm oil is one of those ingredients There's no substitute for palm oil, I believe. You know, in the diaspora, we're so used to having the substitute because we can't really access the same ingredients that we have back home. But I really believe palm oil is one of those ingredients that there's no substitute for. If you've never tasted it, it's rich, it's floral, it's heavy, heavier than butter, but it's also light Mm -hmm. because it just flows through a stew. It flows through a soup. It's almost like the binder in our cooking. Like You can add all these elements to it and layer it with so much flavor and palm oil just coats everything and binds Mm. everything and makes it cohesive. That's the way I think about palm oil. It's an ingredient that grows in different parts of Nigeria. And it's again, one of those ingredients that are fundamentally part of our culture. So it has symbolic meanings outside of having it be a source of food. It's used in baby naming ceremonies. It's used at weddings. It's used in different rituals. Yeah, it's it's a star ingredient. It is 100%. And I always love when I'm buying palm oil, it's red palm oil, and I always get it at either Caribbean markets or West African markets. Mm -hmm. And I look for the palm oil that comes from West Africa because Um, it's indigenous to that place. It's usually harvested sustainably. And then we're getting it from the source. And that's, you know, people have concerns about palm oil, but if you get it from West Africa, you're doing good. Palm oil is used in lotions and soaps and it's the ingredient that's everywhere. And that's the ingredient that might not be sourced sustainably. But red palm oil, there's such a culture of sourcing and giving back to the land with people who grow palm trees. For the longest time, we couldn't get it here because it's just not available to leave the country (laughs) that we we (laughs) use so much of it, you know. Yes, I could get Um, that, yeah. It's not necessarily an industrialized product in the way palm oil is. Red palm oil is completely different. Right. So I thought we could talk about swallows and draws. So they're such Mm. fundamental categories of food in Nigerian cooking. Can you talk first about swallows? What are they? How Mm -hmm. do you eat them? How do you make them? Swallows are a starchy base. I think of them as a vehicle (laughs) for soup. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and they're basically our, the starch element to most of our dishes. Swallows can be made from yam. It could be made from cassava. It could be made from plantains. And the original ingredient could be in any form. So you could use whole ingredients to make swallows, which is where like pounding your yam comes in with the modern pestle, you boil yam or plantains or cassava and you pound it with a modern pestle. But it can also be made from dried powders, which are the same ingredients. So it's the same yam that's been dried and milled into a flour. And you can make your swallow from that. 
And swallows are typically neutral in taste. There's slight distinctions, whether they've been fermented or not. So there might be a slight tang to it. Sometimes there could be like a sweetness, depending on the yam you use, but they're typically neutral in taste. There's no salt added. It's a very neutral ingredient that's used to basically carry soup to your mouth. I love watching people who have eaten with their fingers their whole lives. Yeah. They have this skill of like scooping up this little piece of like yeah. yam, like the pounded yam, Mound. and and then yeah. like roll it in their hand a little bit and then yes. dip it into the stew. It's like a dance with their fingers. And yeah. I have an elder who I'm very close with. And when I watch him eat, I just think this is incredible. So I am I yeah. really appreciate no, that you There's shared. a technique to it, too. Oh, I mean, yeah. it, it takes practice, especially draw soups. Like, who would think that you could eat a draw soup with your hands? <laughs> yeah, so tell people what <laughs> but, are draws. This is a probably yes, unfamiliar term to a soups. lot of folks. So there's this element to our food. And the best way to describe it is like an elasticity. Mm -hmm. And so I think of when I say that, I think of ingredients like okra and ewedu, which is a leaf the um, leaf that's got yeah. the same element as okra does. I think of it as like we love the food the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the food is presented exactly how it is. And I love that embrace of ingredients as they are. So embracing the texture. Yes. It's a feeling. But yeah, draw is a very specific element in Nigerian cuisine or West African cuisine. But it also to me just highlights the way we embrace things exactly as they are. Yeah. And is a goosey also considered a draw or would that be more of a stew? So a goosey is a thickener, is what I describe as a thickener in Nigerian cooking. It's almost like adding peanut butter to your mm. to your soup to make it thicker and richer and creamier. A goosey has the same element of doing that. And a goosey are ground melon seeds, right? Ground melon seeds, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And I, I do love in your book, most of the time you're not telling people to substitute ingredients. You send people like, go to this market, go to that place and I, find yes. traditional ingredients. But I, I did appreciate in that recipe, you said, if you need to, you could substitute pumpkin seeds for yeah. that. So um, <laughs> I think of egusi as a very traditional, important food. It was one of the first stews that I was introduced to. I feel like it's one of the celebration soups because it's so rich and creamy. And, you know, there's different ways to make it, too. There's people who like it really lumpy and like the ground melon seed as like little lumps, almost like little dumplings. Oh, okay. And then there's also people who like it dispersed in the soup. I prefer the lumpy kind. Oh, OK. I have not had that. I've had the one that where it was all blended into the soup. Dis so. Dispersed. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So you touched on this a little bit, but fermented foods are such a huge mm -hmm. part of Nigerian mm -hmm. cooking, and you have them woven throughout your whole book so beautifully. One of them really stuck out to me, which was the fermented rice pancakes. And I'm wondering if you could talk about how you make that recipe and also the importance of fermented foods. I've talked about the ways in which we layer flavors and mm how each dish has like a different approach to flavor. And fermentation is just one of those ways in which we layer flavors. Fermentation also is a way to preserve and make foods last longer. And I think that it just opens up the ingredient to the element so that there's more nutrients accessible to your body. So those are all the reasons you should ferment foods. But with the Cinecer specifically, that was one of my favorite recipes to learn to make. The Cinecer is something that I remembered having in Lagos, but I couldn't quite remember what it was. Like I remember the flavor and the texture of the pancakes, but I couldn't quite remember what the dish was. And so I started doing some research, started talking to people. And I realized that it's basically what it is. It's just fermented rice paste. And so you take some rice, grind it into a flour, add some water, and just let it sit on your counter mm -hmm. for however long, like two to three days, I would say. If you're going for more flavor and more acidity, you could do it longer. But yeah, Cinecere is made from fermented rice paste. It is basically uncooked rice and water. <laughs> yeah. And those are the two ingredients, <laughs> which is wild to me that you could have such like a varying 
texture and flavor with two ingredients. I believe in my recipe, I add a little bit of salt and a little bit of sugar just to highlight what's already there. But sinister is something that I learned to make in the pandemic. It's something that I made with my daughter while she was teething and just wanting something chewy yeah. to like snack on. And learning to make that was such a process for me. I love the back and forth with ingredients. So I remember the first time I made it, the batter was way too loose mm -hmm. and it just kind of crumpled up in the pan. And so I learned from that and made it with less water, a little thicker. Like I love that back and forth with ingredients. I feel like I'm having a conversation with the ingredients and they're talking to me or they're telling me what they like and what they don't like. When I develop recipes, it's always with something in mind. I'm like, I want that specific flavor and that specific texture. And I kind of work backwards from that. And so with Sinister, it was a lot of working backwards because I was trying to create this very specific memory that I had of a texture and a flavor. And so it was just a lot of back and forth with the rice and water. Like, yeah. how much should I put? How much should I, <laughs> like, how much should I take away? Oh, did I add too much salt? Did I add too much sugar? But yeah, it was just a, a back and forth with ingredients. But Sinister is one of my favorite recipes. It's a fermented rice pancake is essentially how I, like a skillet cake right. is how I would describe it. You've been outspoken about your experiences as an undocumented immigrant and also the responsibility of the restaurant industry in this country to do better. And mm. can you talk about what are some of the steps that you think need to be taken to support undocumented workers who are the backbone mm. of the restaurant and food industry? You know, at the end of the day, it's a policy thing. And it's not just restaurants. Right. It's it's the society at large. It's That's the right. governance. It's the laws. And we should say that you became undocumented because you'd gone to college where you didn't have to enroll in classes in the summer. You in graduated with a BA and went to culinary school and didn't know mm -hmm. that you needed to enroll in classes in the summer. And so suddenly they thought you were pulling out of school and you became undocumented and it was right. next to impossible to change it. And so that then set yes. you on the course of a life of being undocumented for uh, over a decade. Exactly. So I felt at that time that it was important for me to be here. And, and I was also 21. So I made a decision that affected my life at 21. But in some ways, restaurant provided a refuge mm. because it was somewhere where I could work. It was somewhere where I knew there were other people just like me. I felt less alone. Like nobody was asking to see my papers. It was just like, you want a job? Then come work. And so in that way, it provided a refuge. But I also know that my story is not the typical story told. When I was undocumented, I didn't hear a lot about Black undocumented immigrants. Right. And whenever I read a story about someone moving here and, quote unquote, making it in the American sense, it never told the story of how they got here, how they sorted out their paperwork. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh, this Nigerian person moved here and is now a medical doctor. Right. And it's just like, wait, what? Like there's a whole part of the <laughs> yes. story that's gone untold. Right. Yes. Which is the reason I started talking about my experience and talking about being undocumented because I think I needed people to understand that undocumented immigrants, we all look very different. We come from different parts of the world and we have different stories. It's that like bite-sized thing where it makes a story very compact and easy to digest. But I'm like, no, these stories are nuanced. These stories are complicated. These stories don't always have a storybook ending. And so that's why I started talking and speaking out about my own process of being undocumented and exactly how I was able to fix it. And, you know, it's it's also crazy to me that the only way that I could fix it, and that's me fixing my own personal story, not the broken system. The only way I could do that was by getting married I think it puts people in such vulnerable positions. I got lucky because I actually got married to someone who I love and who I'm happy to build a family and a partnership with. But just imagine the position it puts a lot of people in vulnerable positions. I don't know what the fix is. <laughs> 
Yeah. As someone who's gone through that, I can say that going through that, it's important to humanize these stories. And I think that's why it's important to add nuance to them and not just flatten people's stories because that's right. these are not illegal aliens or documented people. These are like human beings. Right. What was also crazy to me was that when I finally got my green card, it just, it was this green thing, this green plastic thing in the mail that now said I could travel and I could be here legally. You know, what did that mean? I think I'm still undoing the harm that I lived with and the trauma of it all. And I'm, I'm still trying to make sense of it, that it took one person for me to interview with, with my partner, and that person approved us. Like, mm -hmm. what does that mean? You know, it's a broken system. And I think it goes way beyond the restaurant industry. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing that. Recently, you've been writing for the New York Times, and you are not just confined to one cuisine, but you write about both savory food and pastry and across many cultures, including Nigeria. Mm. What are some of the factors that go into deciding what recipes to represent in print? You know, when I took the job at the Times, and even when I started just consulting as a freelancer for them, I was desperate to see recipes and stories about food that reflected me going through the restaurant industry here in the U.S. and working in magazines and print and test kitchens. I just never really saw my food or food that I recognized from home given the same treatment as French food or Italian food or any of the European foods. And I was desperate for that treatment. I took the job at the time because I wanted to speak directly to an audience that I knew was there. I want to write directly to West Africans and Nigerians mm. and just the people from the continent in general. And I want them to also have that opportunity to see their food in the pages of the Times and not in a way that's like explaining it to them or trying to whitewash it. I just want it to be exactly what it is, kind of the way we present ingredients in Nigeria. That's just how I think about food. And whether it is Nigerian food or Lebanese or Indian or, you know, from wherever the food might come from, I just really try to treat it as exactly what it is and honor it, honor the people who make the food. Well, thank you so much for your approach to this work, for how you are capturing story and food and culture and memory through your recipes and your writing. And thank you for the gift of this beautiful book. It's really groundbreaking and so important. So grateful for this time with you. Thank you so much. This was such a lovely conversation. I really appreciate it. That was Yuande Komalafe author of My Everyday Lagos, Nigerian Cooking at Home and in the Diaspora. We have recipes from Yuande's book, including the Sinisar, those fermented rice pancakes, on our website. You can also make a swallow of sweet potato, yams, or plantains, and a goosey soup. Yuande's recipe is flexible. You can make it with meat or mushrooms and lots of spinach, two hearty pounds. Go to ctpublic.org recipes. We didn't want to make you hungry for Nigerian food without pointing you toward a local restaurant. I asked friend of the show Oni Obiacha where his Nigerian family eats when they want a taste of home, and he recommended Naija Restaurant on the Berlin Turnpike in Newington. You'll find grilled fish and plantains, suya, and six different swallows on the menu. They're proud of their Nigerian beer selection, too. I'm Robin Doyon Aiken. Coming up, Tegan highlights the voices of Bridgeport's Green Village Initiative during a busy Saturday market. She talks with organizers, a trainer, a chef, and teenagers who are learning to become future food justice leaders and urban farmers. It gets you in touch with nature. You can learn how to grow stuff. You get a lot of knowledge. You're listening to Seasoned on Connecticut Public Radio. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Seasoned. I'm Robin Doyon Aiken. Reservoir Community Farm fills a large, lush corner in the city of Bridgeport. During the growing season, the space is full of life. Producer Tegan Engel recently went to the farm on a busy Saturday morning. Thank you so much for your purchase. There's a small farmer's market at the farm's entrance and food trucks nearby. Community folks are harvesting greens from their raised beds, and teens are hard at work planting, weeding, and washing produce. Ellie Engram, the executive director of Green Village Initiative, meets me at the farm. It's one of GVI's key programs. I ask Ellie to share how GVI connects the local community with food and farming. Our mission is to grow food knowledge, leadership, and community through urban gardening and farming to create a more just food system in Bridgeport. We have an urban farm and farmer's market that's selling culturally appropriate and accessible food. We double WIC, SNAP, and senior incentives. And we also have a local incentive called Bridgeport Bucks that we have with the Bridgeport Farmer's Market Collaborative. At the same time, we're hosting volunteer days and free workshops on our farm and classes so that folks understand that it's not about simply coming to GVI to buy produce, but also that they can have a hand in growing the foods that matter to them. Also at the farm, we host our amazing youth leadership program. (laughs) They're right behind us doing some work. I'm watching them right now. Um, And uh, they're wonderful. The summer programming is an employment program where they learn job skills. They learn how to become urban farmers and food justice leaders. And they're paid for their time with us to really become leaders in the community and build the world they want to see. At the greenhouse, I meet Jessica Rosario, the youth leadership program coordinator. Our youth leadership program during the summer, we have all of our teenagers from around Bridgeport. They come, they work on our farm. We try to make sure that they're doing things and understanding they have ownership in this space and that they're the ones who really can do these things on their own despite being young. They still can lead in these spaces and make a lot of big change and a lot of big impact in their community. Inside the greenhouse, there are half a dozen teens weeding around the cherry tomato plants. They explain why they choose to spend their summers working on the community farm. Uh, My name is DJ. I'm 16 and I'm going to be a junior. I've been working with Reservoir Community Farm for a little less than a year. I was just interested in working on the farm and like just being an outdoors, helping my community. I like working here because we do different hands-on activities and then just seeing like the people coming to the farm and like I like being around the the fresh food and all that stuff. It's fun. I think gardening is very therapeutic. When I'm out here gardening with the team I feel calm, relaxed and You know, I just like being around with everyone. My name is Chris. I'm 16 years old and I'm a senior. I've been volunteering here since I was in fifth grade. I mean, I love that community. I love how it brings people together. And it's a peaceful place. It's a calm place. And I love sharing that with others. Uh, My name is Shamaya. I'm 16 and I'm a junior. Um, The things I like on this farm is that you get to grow your own food and help people around the community by like everyone getting equal and affordable food that is healthy. Working here, I feel more active, basically giving my body a really good exercise. When school starts again, I feel like I've done something this summer. It's very nice because we have fun and laugh and enjoy the things we do on the farm. My name is Zane. I'm 16, almost gonna be a junior. I worked here last year, and after that I started volunteering here. We basically maintain the farm, we plant seeds. A big part is weeding because we can't have plants that we don't like. We're the best stealing all the nutrients that the plants we're growing need. Saturdays, there's volunteers, we can help them. There's people who come to the farm stand to buy food. What I like about the farm is it makes you feel welcomed. It's a part of the community. It gets you in touch with nature. You can learn how to grow stuff. You get a lot of knowledge. And yeah, just the people here, they're very nice. If I'm down and I know I have to go work, I'm going to go to work. 95% of the time, I feel better. So it gets a lot off your mind because it's not just working. It's like mind and body health. So that's very good. I'm a people person, so I like to talk to people, ask how they're feeling, interact with them, whether it's good or bad, because you might have some bad days, but on the farm, like I always look forward to the good days. It warms my heart to hear these teens expressing feelings of belonging and purpose here on the farm. This is something that every urban youth engagement program wishes for. The delicious smell of garlic lures me into the crowd of folks gathered around a pop-up kitchen. 
I see my dear friend, Chef Raquel Rivera of A Pinch of Salt, cooking up a storm with some teens, and I ask them what they're making. We have some sauteed radishes, right? We have radish chops, we have kale, we have some red onion and some garlic that's going over some quinoa. And then I'm gonna slice up some radishes that they just picked yesterday and add that to the mix. The Farmer's Market Collaborative hires me to do cooking demos at each market to showcase what is growing and to give people a taste and an education on what to do with the items that they're picking up. Culture is such a big part of our identity, you know, so it's about taking something that's familiar and then introducing something that isn't so that we're open up to not just change radically, but in a way that it makes it feel that we can trust the process. The reason why that's so important is because a lot of us, especially as brown and black people, we have a lot of high salt, uh, cholesterol, a lot of health issues that are extremely important. And so if we can make small changes leading to bigger change that might influence our health that much better, it's important to kind of get that education out there. Farmers markets are extremely important in Bridgeport. The fact that they're located in each different part of Bridgeport to make sure that there's access to fresh fruits and vegetables is amazing. They have a matching program where anyone, no matter what your finances are, can come in to shop. So for every dollar you spend at the farmers market using your EBT, you're matched for a dollar. Even your WIC checks are accepted here. So it's a really nice way of making sure that we're inclusive. As much as I love hearing from Chef Raquel and these teens, I couldn't leave the farm without talking with Lucretia Barraza. She's part of the farm stand crew and a longtime trainer of GVI gardeners. I asked her about what they grow to sell at the farm stand. We plant produce that are familiar to the neighborhood. Then we also try to keep as low as we can, comparable to the local supermarket. And... The best thing is like we harvest one day before farm stand, so we guarantee that our produce are fresh. The most popular is the okra, and then come the beans, tomatoes, collard green is a big produce that people want it. The kale, like the red Russian, white Russian, the uh, Swiss chard. We're growing also green peas and zucchinis and squash and cucumbers. And of course, the garlic. Those are our customer favorite vegetable. If you want to meet Lucretia and support the fabulous folks you just heard, they've got one more market and volunteer day this year on October 28th. For more info about their many programs, visit gogvi.org and follow them on social media at Green Village Initiative. And don't miss their Harvest Festival on November 4th. It's a fundraiser and a party too. That was producer Tegan Engel at Reservoir Community Farm in Bridgeport. I'm Robin Doyon Aiken. Seasoned is produced by me and Tegan and Katie Tolerski, Meg Dalton, Catrice Claudio, Stephanie Stender, Meg Fitzgerald, Sabrina Herrera. Our interns are Leticia Peters and Joey Morgan. Catch this and past episodes of Seasoned covering everything from your favorite ice cream shops to cookbooks to local barbecue, wherever you get your podcasts. And subscribe so you never miss an episode. And let's stay connected. Every month I feature recent episodes, recipes from cookbooks I love, and gardening tips from Charlie Nardozzi in full plate, our newsletter for foodies. Go to ctpublic.org slash newsletters to sign up. And you can always send the show an email at seasoned at ctpublic.org. We love hearing from you. Thanks for listening, everybody. 